Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery. The case we're going to be talking about today is beyond frustrating. It's a case that should have been avoided. There is no reason why this story ended up how it did and yet it happened. It's easy to think that the police are there to protect you, particularly if you're white, straight, cis, middle class and a lot of time that is the case. But what happens when the police fail in their line of duty? What happens when they refuse to admit their mistakes? Who do you go to if the police refuse to help? This is the heartbreaking story of Mytrice Richardson. Mytrice was born on the 30th of April 1985 in California to her parents Michael and Latisse. They were very young, I think they were still in high school, and they later separated. Growing up, Mytrice mainly lived with her mother and her stepfather Jimmy. They moved to Covina, California, which is where Mytrice would grow up. In school, she discovered a love for dance and cheerleading. She was this forever high energy person and she was described by a lot of her friends as a bit of a princess. At the time of her disappearance, she was 24 years old and recently graduated from California State Fullerton University in 2008 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology. She maintained a 4.0 grade point average and she held down two jobs as she did so. This is a woman who was on the right track in life. She'd taken all of the right steps to become successful. At the time of her disappearance, she was working part-time as a go-go dancer at a gay nightclub and she was openly gay, she was an open lesbian. And she had been in a two year long relationship with her girlfriend, Tessa. Although they had recently broken up in the spring of 2009. My trees entered beauty pageants and was trying to build a modeling portfolio, attending lots of auditions in California. She was this beautiful girl and she even attended a party at the Playboy Mansion as a model. She was trying to work out where to go for a master's degree and was also doing clerical work for a shipping company owned by Tessa's father. For all intents and purposes, she seemed to be figuring out her life, trying to work out what the next best step to take was. A very normal girl in her early to mid twenties and one friend described her as uninhibited and funny. But things seemed to change around September 2009. On the 16th of September, Matrice arrives at work in a very happy mood, unusually happy according to her co-workers. She goes out for lunch and she never returns. Apparently she popped back home to Mildred's for a little bit and then says she's going out but doesn't say where she's going. That evening, she drives to a restaurant called Jeffrey's in Malibu. Matrice didn't particularly know Malibu very well, it wasn't an area she tended to spend a lot of time in. She lived with her great grandmother Mildred in South LA, a good 45 minute car journey from Malibu, which is an area mostly reserved for the rich and famous, and Jeffrey's was a fancy restaurant for those rich and famous. She parks up outside the restaurant and waits for the valet to come over to park her car. While she does so, Mytrice actually gets into the valet's car and starts rifling through his CDs. When she's asked why she's in there by the valet, she says it's subliminal and starts muttering about avenging the death of Michael Jackson. He had died only a couple of months earlier and it was still on everyone's minds, clearly was still on Mytrice's. She then wanders into the restaurant and asks if Vanessa was there, probably referring to a girl she had a crush on from the nightclub she danced at. The valet tells the hostess just to keep an eye on Mytrice, she's acting a little bit strange but she's not causing anyone any harm. Mytrice sits down and orders an ocean breeze cocktail and a Kobe steak before deciding to join a nearby table of seven other people. She just sits down with them and joins in on the conversation but they're not too bothered, the hostess checks and they're happy to let her sit with them for a bit, they're happy to like placate her. Eventually she heads back to her table to eat and then she goes back to the other table for more conversation but nothing she's saying to these people really seems to make much sense. Eventually she goes to leave the restaurant but the manager stops her on her way out. She hasn't paid her $89 bill. She explains that the other table should have paid for it but of course they hadn't, they didn't know her. But Mytrice had no money on her. She rambles on about how she's from Mars and she stares at the computer screen as if she's in some kind of trance. She tells them that God had told her to take an afternoon off and then tells them that she lives with her great grandmother. So the restaurant call her great grandmother who offers to pay over the phone but the restaurant are unable to accept that as they needed her to sign for it. And Mildred was in her 90s, she was unable to travel to the restaurant herself. Unsure what to do with my trees, the restaurant called the Lost Hills Sheriff's Department. I just want to take a moment here to explain the difference between sheriffs and police for anyone who's outside of the USA who's unsure. We just have the police in the UK, we don't have sheriffs over here. 
Um, from what I can gather, the main difference is just jurisdiction. A police officer is responsible for the prevention of crime within their city limits, whereas a sheriff is responsible for an entire county, which could include multiple towns and cities. Sometimes these jurisdictions overlap. The sheriff is also publicly voted in and obviously the chief of police is not. If there's anyone in the comments who fancies expanding on this a little bit then please feel free. Honestly I'm still not convinced I really understand the difference but I'm keeping it simple here. In the days before the incident at the restaurant Maitrice had been displaying some odd behaviour that her mum Latisse had picked up on. Maitrice had been sending her mum some concerning texts prompting Latisse to ask her if something was wrong, asking if there was anything she could do to help. Maitrice replies to this, saying, I'm writing a book because you told me I can be anything I wanted. You told me I was Miss America. You told me I was America's next top model. Now do you know what I want to be when I grow up? Miss Mother Nature, because Miss America is a fake ass joke along with everything else we see. So I'm trying to find my way to Michelle Obama to see if she will talk to Mr. Obama about creating my position within the White House. End quote. A very concerning text for anyone to receive, I'm sure, especially a mother. And Latisse urges Maitrice to give her a call. Throughout the night of the 16th, Latisse continues receiving concerning messages from her daughter. Around 10pm, three Lost Hills deputies arrive at the restaurant and get the story of what had been happening from its workers. They speak on the phone with Mildred, who then speaks to Maitrice and warns her that she's about to go to jail, but Maitrice doesn't really seem to care. Of course, Mildred immediately contacts Latisse to let her know what's going on, but there's not much more she can do. Two of the deputies search Maitrice's car, apparently looking for her wallet, with her permission, and inside they find half-drunk bottles of alcohol and marijuana. They administer a field sobriety test there and then, and they find her to be sober. They also find that she knew she was in Malibu, and she was open about the fact that she'd had a cocktail with dinner, so she had a basic understanding of what was going on. She was asked if she was under the care of a physician or taking any medications for any existing conditions and she replies no. She's then asked if she had ever been placed under a 72 hour psychological evaluation and again she says no. The report surrounding this ends by stating that Richardson appeared to be entirely aware of her surroundings and did not seem confused. There was actually no mention of strange behaviour in any of the reports made. But up to nine witnesses at the restaurant confirmed that she was definitely not of sound mind. An email that was later sent between the station lieutenant and the captain described Maitrice as ditzy and that the arresting deputy thought that she was acting unusual and therefore was uneasy about letting her go. Which isn't in line with the arresting report where nothing about her strange behaviour is mentioned, but these higher ups definitely knew about it. So the police have found her to be in possession of marijuana. In 2009 it was legal in California to own for recreational use, although it wasn't really an arrestable offence and usually just resulted in a citation. The restaurant manager considered paying my Teresa's bill so she'd only get a misdemeanor ticket for possession, but he decided against it. He said he didn't want my Teresa to just be able to drive away in her car when she was in clearly such a bad mental way. He thought that she would be safest with the police. So my Teresa is arrested for attempting to defraud an innkeeper and possession of less than an ounce of marijuana. It's worth knowing that Maitrice had no previous criminal record and she'd never been arrested before. She was a model citizen. She's taken to the Malibu Lost Hill Sheriff Department and her car is impounded, apparently on her request. Whilst Maitrice is in the back of the police car, Latisse calls the sheriff station, having been contacted by Mildred. Latisse knows that this is very uncharacteristic behaviour for her daughter and she tells this to the people at the station. She's worried for her daughter, she's never been arrested before and Latisse wasn't sure what to do. You see, Maitrice wasn't her only daughter. She had a 10 year old daughter who was at home in bed by this point being looked after by Latisse. And Latisse wanted to know if they'd been keeping Maitrice at the station overnight. If they were, there was no point in her waking her other daughter just to spend the night waiting in the station. Latisse said, the only way I will come and get her tonight is if you guys are going to release her tonight. She's not from the area and I would hate to wake up to a morning report, girl lost somewhere with her head chopped off. A heartbreaking statement when you hear the rest of this story. Latisse is assured on the phone that Maitrice would be safe at the station and that she would definitely be staying overnight until morning, at which point Latisse could come and pick her up. But as you can probably guess, that is not what happened. 
My trace was released at 12.38 a.m. on the 17th September into an unfamiliar dark area without her ID, her handbag, her phone or her car. She had no means to contact anyone and no means of transport. Station logbooks showed that she had tried to call her great-grandmother four times following her arrest at the station. Her great-grandmother's number was the only one she had memorised and deputies said they heard her talking on the phone. But Mildred insists her phone never rang. She never spoke to Maitrice that night. The phone should have been recording all outgoing calls from it, but of course, apparently it was broken and no recordings were ever made. So it can't be confirmed if Maitrice ever spoke to Mildred that night or not, but we can probably assume that she didn't. Mildred wouldn't lie about that. In Maitrice's mental state, is it really that insane to think that she may have been putting in the wrong number or not putting in any number at all and just speaking to a deadline? At 5.35 a.m. Latisse calls the station to check in on her daughter and she's soon informed that Maitrice was indeed released early in the morning. And of course, she just feels instant panic. Maitrice was clearly in a bad headspace and now she'd been released in the middle of the night in the middle of nowhere, 40 miles from home. There would have been no businesses open for miles, nowhere for Maitrice to take cover in the night. Latisse immediately asks, when can she file a missing persons report? Is it 24 hours, 48 hours? And she's told that they wouldn't recommend that she files that early. But just for your information, there is actually no time limit on how soon you can report someone as missing. So many people think that you have to wait 24 hours to report someone as missing, but that is absolutely not the case. Not in the UK and the USA at least. If you are concerned about a person, you can report them as missing straight away. Latisse is told to call back in a couple of hours if she doesn't hear from my trees, which of course she doesn't because she was let out of jail in a bad mental state with no phone and no money no means of contact. About an hour after Latisse called the station, they receive a call from a man who lived in nearby Montanido at the bottom of Dark Canyon, which is about six miles away from the station. This man reported a slim black woman with afro hair walking through his back garden, and when he asked if she was okay, she replied, I'm just resting, and then quickly vanished. The station sent deputies to investigate, but the woman was long gone by then. If this was my trees, and let's face it, we can be 99% sure that it probably was, then she would have been walking for hours at this point. And I'm unsure if they made the immediate connection to my trees. They probably didn't because she hadn't been reported as missing officially by this point. And a bolo, a be on the lookout alert, wouldn't be issued for another six and a half hours for my trees. And of course she would never be seen again. The area in which she was wandering, the Santa Monica Mountains, is full of rolling hills, rocks, long roads, and all kinds of wildlife. It would have been hard to walk the route she had taken in daylight with an idea of where she was going. She was doing it at night with no awareness of her surroundings. The Sheriff's Department came up with a number of reasons as to why Maitrice was released when she was. They said that they offered her the option to sleep in the reception, but she left anyway, saying she was going to meet friends and they couldn't force her to stay. They've said that they had to release her due to overcrowding. Or they've said that they had to release her because she was obviously educated and intelligent and therefore they couldn't justify keeping her overnight. The Richardson family hoped to gain some understanding of Maitrice's behaviour by reviewing footage of Maitrice at the jail that night. They wanted to see the tape from her cell. And of course they're told that no such tape exists. Only it did. And Captain Thomas Martin of the Lost Hill Station confessed months later that the video was in his desk drawer. I found a quote of Latisse telling Newsweek, she clutches at the mesh screening and is rocking side to side like a small child which is what I assume they saw on the tape when they finally got to see it months later. Later, the Sheriff's Department spokesman announced that Maitrice exhibited no signs of mental incapacitation whatsoever, which just doesn't add up with the rest of the story here. It was also later discovered that a separate edited CCTV footage showed somebody from the Sheriff's Department, a deputy, walking out of the station, looking like he's kind of following Maitrice. Of course, this could be nothing, it could just be somebody leaving the station to go home or to do his job, but the family were already untrusting of the department as a whole by this point. So they question why they were never told of this CCTV in the first place. It looks like this deputy is following Maitrice out. Maitrice is later seen in the back garden six miles away, and it does seem like she was alone at this point. Although there are reports I read that said that she was actually with a man, 
I'm inclined to believe that this is false though. I'm pretty sure it was just her. It took two days for the sheriff's department to conduct his first search. Two days with my trees missing out in the mountains. They start from the location where she was last seen, the back garden, and they find tracks from her shoes, which looked as if she'd been running. But they can't follow the tracks for long. They can't just follow them to where they go and then they get mixed in with like animal footprints and that's it. That was it for the original search. Maitrice was an LA resident and therefore the fact that she was missing fell under the jurisdiction of the LAPD's missing persons unit. Although the Lost Hill Sheriff's Department did remain involved in the search. But just three days in, her case is transferred from the missing persons unit to the LAPD's Robbery Homicide Division purely because they had better resources and would enable a better search for Maitrice. They said that this did not mean it was a homicide case. The LAPD look into Maitrice's journals, phone records and text messages and conclude that she likely hadn't slept for many days leading up to the 16th, suggesting that she may have been suffering from a bipolar episode. Although her ex-girlfriend, Tessa, said that Maitrice was never diagnosed with any mental illness and she wasn't on any medications. That doesn't mean, of course, that she didn't have something undiagnosed, but as far as I'm able to tell, she'd never had an episode like this before. It was confirmed several months later by the LAPD's mental health consultants that Maitrice was definitely experiencing mental issues. Perhaps she'd suffered a full-on mental breakdown. The immediate searches after Maitrice's disappearance were poor. They did the search a couple of days after where they found her footprints, but they didn't venture into the mountains, they didn't search the canyon, they didn't really look for her. They carried out four searches over the next few months, but it was only in January 2010, so four months after her disappearance, that they finally conducted a proper big search. And to their credit, I think it was one of the biggest searches that had ever been conducted in this area. So they did go all out. It was just four months too late. They had about 240 people, both professionals and volunteers. They had dogs, horses, helicopters. But by this point, they weren't looking for Maitrice alive. They were looking for a body in an 18 square mile area of Malibu Canyon. And of course, they find nothing. But her parents, particularly her father, don't give up. Michael later said that during this period, he saw Maitrice everywhere. Even on a trip to Las Vegas he went on, he like saw this random girl and followed her thinking it was Maitrice. Was it possible she'd walked her way out of the canyon and was just living somewhere else now? Latisse had a harder time and believed that her daughter was dead pretty early on, but they both still fought for justice. In late June, a school friend of Maitrice actually reported seeing her in Las Vegas at a casino. And the police did take every sighting report seriously and they traveled to Vegas to investigate. But of course, the sightings lead nowhere. For a long time, Maitrice's case is quiet with the occasional sighting to investigate. Her parents arranged a fifth search of the canyon with unmanned drones to no avail. The sheriff department's handling of this case from the get-go was questionable and it's actually reviewed by the Office of Independent Review. There's question over whether the station endangered Maitrice by releasing her when and how they did. Shockingly, or not so shockingly, it's actually ruled that they did not endanger Maitrice by releasing her when they did and they cite the sheriff's manual to back up their decision. Misdemeanor prisoners shall be released in the field whenever it's reasonable and safe to do so. But I'll argue here. In what world do they think it was reasonable and safe to release a woman in the middle of the night with no car, no phone and no money who's clearly suffering a mental break? In what world can they use that as their defence? As we've already established, emails between higher-ups in the department confirmed that they knew she was acting strange at the time and they had the CCTV to show it. But basically, the department could just choose what they wanted to hand over to the Office of Independent Review, the watchdog, and they just chose not to give them the incriminating stuff. The report reiterated that Maitrice had been offered to stay in the station until she could arrange transportation, but she decided to leave and they let her because they couldn't force her to stay. But did they have more of a duty of care for somebody who was clearly mentally ill? It was August when the case took a huge turn. The sheriff's department had been aware of a marijuana farm on Dark Canyon, a farm that they had raided a year beforehand and flattened. It was the perfect place for such a farm. It was a very difficult place to reach and it wasn't the kind of place that people could just happen to stumble upon. There were no public footpaths and you basically got to climb a mountain to reach it via foot. But it was within two miles of where Maitrice was last seen in the back garden. 
On the 9th of August 2010, rangers had been sent to inspect this marijuana farm to ensure that the growers hadn't come back and re-established the farm. So the rangers arrive, they have a look around, they're satisfied that people hadn't started to grow there again, and they begin to head back downstream. Only as they do so, they notice a skull in the creek. Beneath the leaves, they notice a full body, semi-decomposed and entirely naked. Sources describe the remains as mummified. Of course, these rangers immediately alert dispatch who contact Lost Hill Sheriff's Department. The station sends up some deputies to guard the remains, and as you can probably guess, these remains were soon confirmed to be those of Maitrese Richardson. A deputy arrived at the scene at 1.30pm, almost an hour and a half after the remains were reported. This was August, they would have had hours of daylight left at this point to treat the scene, get the coroner over to remove the remains, collect evidence, all of that stuff. The coroner should have been informed of the discovery straight away, as according to state law. But the coroner wasn't informed of these remains until 2.58pm, almost three hours after the remains were first found. Therefore, the coroner and helicopter couldn't make it to this very remote location in time before the sun began to set. So the detectives make a very strange choice here. They remove the remains themselves and airlift them back to the Lost Hill Sheriff Station, despite the state code specifically stating that remains or a body cannot be moved from their position without permission of the coroner. And the deputies did not have permission. It was unheard of for this choice to be made. They said that they didn't want to leave the remains there overnight in case the animals got to them. But at the end of the day, my Teresa's remains had likely been there for almost a year at this point. Why were the deputies so quick to move them now? Why couldn't they just keep guard for another 10 to 12 hours until the sun rose again and the coroner could access the scene and do the job properly? What was this huge rush? The deputies didn't do anything a coroner would usually do at the scene. They didn't take the correct photos, they didn't collect soil and plant samples, they didn't move the body properly. They just picked up the body parts and took them to the station. So when the coroner eventually came to evaluate the situation, all they had was this body that had been messed with and moved. They had no context, which is a very important thing when they're analysing any death. All they could look at was this body that was in front of them. This body that still had flesh on the bones and so hadn't been entirely ravaged by animals as one would expect after being out in the wilderness for so long. Her clothes were no longer on her body although an earring was found nearby and Jean's belt and bra were later recovered. How likely would it be that an animal would remove her clothes including undoing a belt and undoing zipper whilst leaving them intact but also leaving flesh on her body. It seemed a bit strange. Oh, and just to add insult to injury as well, when the deputies removed my Teresa's body, they didn't get all of it. Maybe due to laziness or maybe due to lack of education in the human anatomy, which is generally why a trained professional or coroner is usually left to do the job themselves. As I mentioned, my Teresa was partially mummified, which was strange seeing as if she died via natural causes, then she likely would have been outside for 11 months at this point. And this was Malibu, it was warm. Mummification instead of a full decomposition in this climate is very difficult to understand. Um, she was also found with her arm flexed, which is an entirely unnatural position for a dead body. It was almost as if her arm had been held in place while she died and rigor mortis set in. The way my Teresa's body was found, her arm should have just naturally fallen down. But it didn't, it was found flexed upright. And this led people to wonder if she died in a separate location and been put there later. But of course the coroner hadn't attended the scene so the coroner couldn't confirm or deny anything to do with this really. All they had was this body, they didn't know the context in which it was found. The then sheriff Lee Backer held a press conference in which he said we have no indication of homicide at this point. I don't believe that the remains are capable of telling us a story. But they didn't really investigate properly though. A lot of significant items found at the site were never tested, the soil was never tested, there was just an all round lack of testing. Her clothes were actually lost and found later screwed up in a ball at the bottom of the body bag. The death was deemed to be an accident as there was no sign of foul play and no cause of death could be determined. A second search of the area for more clues is done about six months later and Latisse and other friends and family members actually joined this search and one of the family members actually finds one of Maitreese's finger bones in the dirt. The police did the job so badly that a family member of Maitreese had to find her finger bone 
in the dirt. In December 2010, Latisse sat down with Sheriff Backer to submit a request for my Teresa's body to be exhumed and re-examined, hopefully by the FBI. Backer says that he'd actually called the FBI the day before and they'd already agreed to do this examination, but the FBI later said that they'd never agreed to this, this had never happened. Backer said that he didn't agree with the cause of death and questioned the removal of her trousers and her belt. But nothing ever really comes of this though. Backer just says publicly, it's time for the parents to grieve. He's saying one thing publicly and one thing to Latisse. So in July 2011, Latisse and Michael exhume the body themselves and pay a private pathologist to investigate. But I couldn't find any information as to whether anything new came of this. I assume probably not. The entire investigation was flawed. My Teresa's death was ruled an accident and it seems that the sheriff's department just moved on. In 2011, both Michael and Latisse file separate wrongful death suits and they're awarded $450,000 each by Los Angeles County. The lawsuits basically argued that deputies failed in their duties by releasing my trees into the night and clearly the court agreed. In 2015, the California Attorney General's office agreed to conduct a criminal investigation into the Los Angeles County Sheriff Department to once again review the handling of my Teresa's case. The Richardson sent nearly 500 pages of documents and reports about the case to Attorney General Kamala Harris's office, hoping that she would be able to press charges against the Sheriff's Department. However, the reply comes saying, the records you provided do not create a reasonable inference that the actions of the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department or its employees violated the law. Nor, in our view, does it appear that the Sheriff's Department failed to properly respond to your complaints, unquote. However, fast forward three months and the Attorney General's office makes a complete 180, agreeing to conduct a full criminal investigation, which they do and on December 30th, 2016, they conclude that there was insufficient evidence to support criminal prosecution of anyone involved in the handling of this case. But it's worth knowing that whilst all of this was happening, there were things going on in the background to do with Sheriff Lee Backer. In 2012, the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, filed a federal civil rights lawsuit against Lee Becker for extraordinary brutality committed against inmates by deputies in LA County jails, for which he is responsible. He is responsible for the deputies below him. Two ex-inmates claimed to be beaten and threatened with violence, and also witnessed deputies beating other inmates as well. Backer resigned in the wake of this scandal and he begins lying through his teeth to federal investigators in an attempt to cover his own back. He insists that he played no role in the misconduct of his deputies, only it came out that he definitely did and he's arrested on three counts, obstruction, conspiracy to obstruct and making false statements to federal investigators. This was huge, and in May 2017, he sentenced to three years in federal prison, and every one of his appeals have been denied. His undersheriff, Paul Tanaka, was also sentenced to five years on very similar charges. So you've got the sheriff and the undersheriff who are both obviously corrupt. Dozens of former sheriff's officials have been convicted as a result of this investigation. So I think we can probably say with certainty that these were not law-abiding deputies, that they cut corners, they abused inmates. So is it really hard to believe that they simply didn't care when they released my trees? At the very least, this is them being lazy, just releasing her out into the wild. They can't be asked to implement their duty of care. At the very worst, was she abused in jail herself? Did a deputy have something to do with her disappearance? This whole thing would be a lot more unbelievable if this station had no history of misconduct, but Lost Hills was undeniably dodgy. And there's also the fact that Backer was tried and found guilty on three counts relating to obstruction of justice. So it really isn't a leap to think that he probably covered up some things in relation to Matrice's case as well. I mean, we already know about the CCTV and the edited CCTV and he at least tried to cover that up probably other stuff too. A man called Alex Villanueva is the new sheriff and he has said that he wants to pursue the truth and get to the bottom of what happened in Mitrice's case. During a memorial to mark the 10 year anniversary of Mitrice's mysterious disappearance, which was just a couple of months ago, he said, I want to assess the entire case from the beginning with a whole new fresh set of eyes. And that means we'll go back and we're going to canvas and we're going to walk the entire length of it. He said that only a couple of months ago, so we're going to have to wait and see if there are any new steps taken. 
but there still stands a $30,000 reward for information about what happened to my trees and the case has never officially been closed and the department is happy to hear any new information but it doesn't seem like anyone new has been assigned to the case as of yet, they're just happy to hear anything new. Clearly the Malibu Lost Hills Sheriff's Department was corrupt from the beginning. There are so many things that could have and should have been done differently in my Teresa's case. But why was this case handled so badly from the beginning anyway? Was it just that the deputies didn't care? Was it because of her skin colour or was it because of a lack of training in mental health? There's a really interesting parallel to making this story to the case of Mel Gibson, who was arrested by the same department in 2006 for drink driving. Upon his very quick release, he was allegedly driven back to get his car by deputies and then he's just let go. But he also reportedly went on an anti-Semitic tirade at the time of his arrest, so he probably should have been charged with racism as well. But he wasn't. He is treated with dignity, he's allowed to sober up in his cell, then they drive him back to get his car, and they just let him go, when they should probably have kept him in for a while. He maybe should have gone to jail for being very, very racist. But why was my Therese not given even an ounce of the dignity they treated Mel Gibson with? Was it her skin colour? Was it a lack of money? Why was Latisse lied to when she asked about filing a missing persons report? Why did they not do a proper search for her until four months after her disappearance? Why did they move her body when they did and not wait until morning? I think it's easy to think that my Teresa's skin colour probably didn't have anything to do with the way she was treated, but you really do have to ask the question. If a pretty young white girl had gone missing in the same way as my Therese, would the police have really waited four months to conduct a proper search? Would the media have picked up the case sooner? I mean, more media equals more pressure on the police. Would they have let a young white girl walk into the night alone? Would they have put a bolo out sooner than six hours after my Therese was last seen? These six hours are really, really important. They are what gave my Therese the time to get lost in the canyon if that is really what happened to her. If they'd search for her immediately, then she'd likely still be alive now. I think the outcome of this case is a mixture of everything. Systematic inbuilt racism, a lack of education surrounding mental health, and general laziness in the sheriff's department. The new sheriff, Alex Villanueva, says that if my Therese was arrested today, she'd be subjected to a full mental health examination before release. And I don't doubt that. Awareness of mental health has come leaps and bounds in the past 10 years. It's just a shame that my Therese didn't get this option. But there's one thing I'm certain of in this case. Sheriff Backer definitely took great lengths to cover things up. There's probably still things that the public and the family don't know and I hope one day it all comes out. Her death may have been accidental, but questions remain as to how she got to such a secluded area in the first place. How did her clothes end up off? Did she remove them herself or did somebody else do it? There's theories ranging from a bad reaction to poison ivy or a rattlesnake bite or maybe she was murdered by somebody when she happened across the marijuana farm. Nobody knows how she ended up in the creek in the position that she did. Why was her arm mummified in such a strange position? There are so many questions in this case and I really hope their family one day get their answers. Which brings me full circle back to the questions I posed at the beginning of this video. What do you do when the police fail you? Who do you turn to? And it seems like, for all intents and purposes, the Sheriff's Department were following the law. Nothing has found them guilty of doing anything wrong in this case. Which leads me to think that maybe they need to close some loopholes here because clearly my truce was failed. Even if the legal system doesn't find they failed, they failed her. I'm gonna link all of my sources down below as always if you want to take a deeper look into this case. Um, there's actually a website run by her father called, I think it's bringmytreeshome.org, but I'll leave it down below in case you want to have a look at that. Um, her family are doing amazing things to try and get justice for her and I really hope that answers begin coming out. Um, thank you so much for watching. I upload these videos every single Wednesday where I bring light to the stories of missing people or murdered people. And if you'd like to click that subscribe button, you'll be alerted every single week when that comes out. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.